make decisions who and what we are following. Our message today is seeing Jesus clearly. And it's interesting because if you read the Bible and you read the account of the Easter story, after Jesus was resurrected, people seem to have trouble recognizing him. Mary Magdalene, when she saw him in the tomb, thought he was the gardener. The two men that we're going to look at in the scripture today going on the road to the ice, talked to him for a great time, studying the scripture as they walked. And yet it wasn't until they got to the location and Jesus broke the bread that their eyes were open and they recognized Jesus. You know, the truth of it is, my friends, when you're going towards Jesus, if you're not looking for him, sometimes you can miss him. And that is as true today as it was back then. Our scripture today is Luke 24, verses 13 through 31, or 32, excuse me. That very day, two of them were going to the village of Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about the things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing that together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. And said to them, the one named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some of the women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb in mourning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen visions of angels who said to them, He was alive. Some of them went with the, to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see. But him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of hearts to believe, all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures and the things concerning himself. So they drew near the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So we went to stay with them, and when they was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? I think it's interesting that these folks did not immediately recognize Jesus. I've heard many commentaries say that that's because the resurrected body of Jesus looks different and that it's not always easily identified. And there may be something to that. But I will suggest to you that I think the reason these folks didn't recognize Jesus was because they weren't looking for him. He wasn't the first person that they were expecting to see today. They were fixed upon the death of Jesus and his missing body. They were not seeking a resurrected God. They were truly not seeing Jesus clearly because they didn't understand what a risen Jesus would look like. And I think if that's true of them 2,000 years ago, it could probably be true of you and I as well. We can, if we're not careful, lose fat 
We can lose the truth in the world that we live in and the noise that brings us around. It reminds me of a story of a mother who was getting tired of cleaning up the bathroom after her teenage children. And so one day after cleaning, she wrote a sign, please leave the bathroom as you found it. Well, she went back into the bathroom a short time later and noticed that, as usual, her son had left a mess. So she called him and said, Brian, how did you find the bathroom? And after a brief pause, he said, well, it's straight down the hall, the first door on the right. <laughs> we can be a little bit like Brian. We can be to the point where we look at things from one perspective only and miss the truth. Think about your day on any given day and ask yourself, how much of that day do I spend seeking and looking for God? Now, I am very fond of the term, the Sunday school answer. And if you're sitting in Sunday school or if you're sitting in church, we all know what the right answer is. I spend all day looking for God. I spend all day seeking God. Sounds good. It's the right answer, the Sunday school answer that you should give. But the question I have to ask you is, does it sound real? Is it honest? And if I'm truthful, it is not. much of my life is spent responding to the world and the noise that it brings to my life. In fact, if I am not careful, this world can distract me so severely that some days I don't even think about Jesus Christ. I get so busy trying to take care of all the problems that come to my life from a work, from Spouses from everything that goes on in the world, all the troubles, all the struggles, all the things that need to be done, can quickly and will quickly overwhelm any thoughts of God. And the truth of it is, I would like to tell you that's the exception rather than the rule. But the truth of it is, the exception is the days that I spend way more time talking about God. And it's hard because the world is demanding. If you have a boss, he's going to tell you what he expects out of you today. And if you don't meet that expectation, you can be sure you will hear about it. That's the nature of a boss. The world will tell you the things that need to be taken care of today. The car that needs a new muffler. The house that needs new ease. The, all the things that need to be done today. Or perhaps yesterday. And so you're already a day behind. The world is great at demanding your attention. The world is fantastic at holding you hostage and making demands upon your time, your mind, and everything about you. Jesus Christ, on the other hand, isn't demanding. And he will not yell to get your attention. Jesus Christ simply waits patiently for me to focus on him. And so consequently, very much like those folks that we just read about, I don't always see Jesus as clearly as I should, as clearly as he desires me to be. There was an article written by a guy named William Fenner. If you haven't heard of him, it's not surprising. He lived from 1600 to 1640, so none of you knew him personally, except maybe Freeman. I don't know, he's getting under age. Uh, but the truth of it is, he wrote an article back in the 1600s that is every bit as relevant today as it was in the 1600s. And it reads as follows. When a man looks to Christ in such a way that he follows him, when a man sees him as his only means of being happy, godly, and in the favor of God, the only means to do and will be well, and genuinely desires to follow after him, this is to look up to Christ. 
when a man sincerely labors to follow the counsel and direction of Christ in all his ways. He bids him to deny himself, and that is the thing that he labors for. He bids for him to repent of all his sins, apply himself to God's holy paths, and rely on him for strength and acceptance, mercy, pardon, and every blessing. Whenever he looks for the hands of God, he sets himself to follow God's counsel and to expect it in him. If he sees sin, he looks up to Christ, and there he sees Christ's death to frame him. When he sees what the power that has been over him, he looks up to Christ for the Spirit to subdue them according to the means that have been appointed, namely by prayer, meditation, watchfulness, striving, purposing, endeavoring, and fighting against all the lust of his flesh. And in whichever ways he may fail, his labor to be humble and to continue looking to Christ for forgiveness and more help against another time. William Fenner could have written this in 2021 and it would have been just as relevant as it was in the 1600s. If I want to see Jesus clearly, I need to focus on Jesus. I need to say to the world around me, you are second. All the concerns, all the problems, all the issues that crowd my mind for my attention have to be relegated to something else. Something less than Jesus Christ. I am not capable of doing that on my own, nor are you. And I'll be honest with you, if we're really honest with each other, we will have to say that on every average day, Jesus Christ is a small portion of that day. And I have to say, while I know that's true, it's not good. Now, it is so interesting to me today to go out into the world and hear people tell me, Phrases about Jesus Christ. One of the most popular phrases today is, well, that's not my Jesus. That may be your Jesus, but that's not my Jesus. My Jesus wouldn't think that way. My Jesus wouldn't act that way. My Jesus, if I, in fact, to listen to the world, there has to be over a thousand Jesuses out there with totally different personalities. Because the world tells me there's a tens of thousands of ways of looking at Jesus' teachings. Now, I can tell you from just knowing what I know about the Bible, there was only one Jesus Christ. And he only had one set of teachings. And they're in the scripture. If that doesn't agree with what you're thinking, then that tells you something. Jesus Christ is not all things to all people. He died for all to be forgiven, but not all will accept that. In fact, many will not. Many will fight and say, no, there are other ways. There are other ways to going to heaven. Jesus Christ is not the only way. Again, I've told you this many times before, but it bears repeating. Jesus Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. My friends, Jesus is lauded by the Muslim community as being a great prophet. If Jesus Christ is not the Son of God, if he's not the way of salvation, then he is either a liar a lunatic, but he is the Son of God. You can't have it all three ways. You cannot reduce Jesus Christ to a great prophet and say, well, he's one of many ways to heaven because Jesus Christ himself said, I am the only way. We have to realize while the world would like to have a thousand different Jesuses with a thousand different views, we are not left with that option. There is only one Jesus Christ. There is only one Son of God. Only one died on that cross and took my sins. And 
That's the one I better be following. That's the one I better be seeking. Now I'm here to tell you that seeking God because the world is so noisy is hard. Because the world is not going to let me have quiet time to seek Him. You do not have to take much of your day and look at it to wonder how much time do I spend seeking for God? How much time do I spend in Bible study? How much time do I spend in prayer? Or as William Fetter would say, how much time do I spend in meditation? Seeking God. The truth of it is, my friends, the amount of time you spend will tell you an awful lot about how much you're seeking God. And the amount of time you spend seeking God will tell you an awful lot about whether you are seeing God clearly. Those first century people did not recognize Jesus immediately because they weren't looking for him. They were trying to figure out all the craziness that was going on in their life. Jesus Christ had told them, I will die and I will rise again. That truth was there, and every Christian that knew and followed him should have been very much aware of it. But they were distracted by the world around them, just as you and I are distracted. We are literally in the same boat that they are in. Today we live in a very chaotic world with a lot of shouting voices, and they all demand their attention. And the truth of it is, I do not think that's going to change. Those shouting voices from the TV to all the other things around you are going to continue to tell you, I demand your attention today. Jesus Christ, on the other hand, is quietly waiting for you to say silence to the world and focus on him. I am not going to get closer to God by listening to the world. I am going to get closer to God by telling the world I'm too busy right now talking to Jesus. It reminds me of a story of a couple of lawyers that went into a restaurant, they put their briefcases on the floor, and ordered two coffees. After they got their coffees, they opened up their briefcases and pulled out sandwiches. And the waitress said, I'm sorry, sir, but you cannot eat your own food here. It's against the rules of the restaurant. Lawyers looked at each other, shrugged their shoulders, and swapped sandwiches. <laughs> they found the solution. And I think too often we, like the lawyers, want to twist Jesus to fit us, rather than be transformed by him. I'm here to tell you, trusting in Jesus is not easy. He tells me I have to stop focusing on the world around me that's shouting at me and be silent and listen for his still small voice. I will not see Jesus clearly if I have not decided to seek him first before the world, before my own interests and desires. It isn't a difficult concept, but it is hard. The idea of seeking Jesus first is very simple. No one has difficulty understanding that when it says seek God first. But the actual doing of it, that, my friends, is extremely hard. In fact, if I'm honest, it's too hard for me. It's too hard for you. We cannot do it by ourselves. So where does that leave us? Well, my friends, it leads us back to Jesus. What I cannot do, he can. What I am overwhelmed by, he has conquered. Seeing Jesus clearly involves me taking my eyes off myself and putting them completely on Jesus. It means denying any of my own strength and trusting only in him. If you want to see Jesus more clearly, Start asking him to refocus you on him. Deny the distractions. 
and allow God to speak to you in that still small voice. Matthew 7, 7 through 8 tells us, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who sees and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Just as that first Easter, Jesus can sometimes be difficult to recognize. But if we're seeking him, just like those first Christians, our eyes can be and will be opened. And we can and will see him clearly. The question I want to leave you today, my friends, is can you see Jesus clearly? Or is he still in that massive confusion? Still lost among the world's shouting voices. We do not want to be in a position in this world where the world can outspeak Jesus Christ. I do not want the world challenging Jesus' control in my life. Because in this day and age, my friends, as we grow in closer and closer to those end days, I need to be closer to Jesus, not more distant. I need to see him more clearly and not more confused. We live in a time where it's time to make choices. Who do I follow? Who do I listen to? Who do I seek? And my friends, seeking anybody but Jesus Christ will lead you to a death and destruction that will not be good. But my friends, I can also tell you, seeking Jesus Christ can release you from every struggle and trouble you have in this world. And I love 